My laboratory for a number of years uh, has been very interested in the mechanisms of cellular protection. In particular, we've been interested in the connection between nutrients and protection and the entry of a cell into a protected state. And so about 10 years ago, I started thinking about how to utilize this knowledge and, uh, and this uh, discovery that we had made many years ago that if you starve a cell, a yeast cell, a simple cell, that cell becomes highly protected. But uh, then we also discovered that uh, if you express an oncogene uh, in the same cell, uh, now that cell becomes very sensitive. And from that came the idea of uh, differential stress resistance, which was really about uh, what if we starve a mouse, and that's originally what we did, and then eventually a person would, the, uh, would their cells in a coordinated way go into this uh, protected mode, and yet every cancer cell, uh, by virtue of having an oncogene, uh, uh, disobeys, and, and in fact it continues on to the sensitized mode, uh, which makes, makes them actually more sensitive to chemotherapy rather than less sensitive. So this was a, a very nice way to uh, separate uh, the normal cells, all normal cells and all cancer cells, no matter where they were uh, in, the, in the body. We have a number of uh, clinical trials ongoing at USC, uh, Mayo Clinic, uh, Leiden University, University of Genova, uh, Charité University in Berlin. And, uh, and uh, the uh, preliminary results are, are, uh, look good, very promising. And so these are about uh, combined maybe about 30 or 40 patients, uh, but they're still preliminary. And I think we need to wait at least until the Charité study is, is completed as 50 patients uh, randomized, and that should be uh, published probably in the next three or four months. Uh, but I certainly think that already now patients, they don't feel they have a viable option, can certainly talk to their oncologist and, uh, and ask, uh, is this something that uh, may be beneficial to me considering uh, that there are out of option or, or options that even the oncologist thinks uh, it, it could work. In the clinical trials, in most cases, we have either two days before, two days of fasting before chemotherapy and one day after, or three days of fasting before chemotherapy and one day after. Uh, and we believe that the three plus one is probably the most beneficial. Uh, we've also developed a, uh, because every cancer patient asked us the same question, what can I eat uh, instead of fasting, or is there anything that I can eat? Um, we uh, developed a, a fasting mimicking diet with the funding from the National Cancer Institute, and, uh, and now most of the trials are actually using the fasting, all, virtually all are using the fasting mimicking diet and not the, uh, and not the fasting itself. Now, uh, for people, uh, obviously, this is not available to people yet, to patients yet. Uh, so for the time being, fasting is, uh, is an okay option uh, instead of the fasting mimicking diet. We try to stay as close as possible to normal food, so it contains soups and bars and chips. And, but all of them, of course, they look like regular food, but they're really uh, being uh, screened and tested in mice first and then in people for their ability to uh, allow the, the changes that, that we look for. And there, is an, uh, there are a number of changes. Major ones are in growth factors, IGF-1 and IGF-PP-1 and, and glucose and ketone bodies. Uh, so uh, basically, it's all foods that don't interfere with the fasting-dependent changes in those markers. By virtue of working on aging, we also work on cancer prevention. Aging, of, of course, the major risk factor for, for cancer is aging. And, um, and so one of the, um, whether we look at yeast aging or mouse aging and, and lately uh, human aging, the, uh, the genes and pathways that control longevity also seem to control DNA damage. Um, and so we've been very interested in, in, in that aspect. And um, we uh, have published a long time ago on the relationship between the TOR pathway, TOR assist kinase pathway, and protection, uh, so the deletion of genes in the distor pathway, uh, which responds to amino acids and, um, and the DNA damage. And we've shown that uh, simple cells that lack distor assist kinase signaling are 
very much longer lived. They lived two or three times longer, but they're also very protected against uh, DNA damage, not just point mutation, but also gross chromosomal rearrangements and, and uh, uh, small insertions and deletion, et cetera. And then, uh, so we've then followed up um, with uh, mouse studies and human studies. And in, the, in mice, uh, we actually just published that and shown that by uh, using dietary manipulations, in this case, we use this, this fasting mimicking diet periodically uh, every uh, couple of weeks in mice and once a month in people. Uh, but in mice, we show that, that by controlling this uh, protein and amino acid signaling pathways, even periodically, we are able to reduce the cancer uh, incidence in the mouse by, by about 50%. Um, then we also uh, looked at, because again, proteins are controlling this TOR signaling, and also uh, another key gene in uh, promoting aging or aging promotion, which is called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1. And because of uh, that uh, protein controlling this IGF-1 in, in TOR, we uh, looked at the role of protein intake uh, in mortality from all causes and from cancer in the U.S. population. So uh, last year we published that people that had a high protein intake, so the uh, people that had a protein intake over 20 percent, uh, so over 20% of calories coming from protein compared to people that had less than 10% of calories coming from protein. They displayed a 75% increase in uh, the risk of overall mortality and a three to four fold increase in the risk uh, to develop cancer. Now, this is a relatively uh, small population, about 6,000 people, so we, we cannot use that in a, in a conclusive manner, but certainly uh, that was remarkable that we saw a significant three to four fold increase in the um, chance of developing uh, cancer uh, for people that had the highest uh, protein intake. In support of that is also our study from three years ago with this population in Ecuador that lacks the growth hormone IGF-1 uh, that has a mutation in the growth hormone receptor IGF-1 axis. And, uh, and these subjects are, are also turned out to be uh, protected from cancer uh, and also diabetes. So I think uh, if you put it all together, also with the mouse data showing both the protein affects cancer in mice and the growth hormone IGF-1 signaling very much affects cancer in mice. I think if you put it all together, you get a pretty uh, solid picture about uh, um, the role of this um, protein-dependent uh, pro aging pathways which involve IGF-1 and TOR cyskinase signaling uh, the role of this in cancer um, incidents in, in both mice and humans. Uh, carbohydrate intake is, is a little bit trickier. Uh, we have described a long time ago uh, the role of glucose in uh, activating a second pathway, which is the RAS uh, PKA pathway in yeast, and then others have shown uh, this similar effects in, in Drosophila and mice. Um, the the problem is that um, the, um, the carbohydrate intake, high carbohydrate intake, is also associated with uh, longevity in mice, meaning that the, the low, this is work by the Simpson group in Australia and others, uh, the low protein, high carbohydrate diet seems to be the, the best for longevity. Uh, now, that doesn't mean it's low protein, high sugar diet. It's a low protein, high complex carbohydrate diet. And this is also what we saw in the, in the population studies that I mentioned earlier. So uh, most likely uh, keeping uh, sugar levels low is, is important, but carbohydrate intake uh, is still appears to be, still appears to be uh, the best. So carbohydrate still appears to be the best source of calories, of course. The only other option would be high fat, low carb, low protein, and uh, both animal studies and human studies suggest that that's probably not a good way to go. The take home message, if you, if you put it all together with a lot more studies and also centenarian studies, you look at the populations from around the world that are particularly long lived and they have very low cancer, whether it's Okinawans and some of the southern Italians. They, the group in Loma Linda. These studies support the role for a low protein, uh, high complex carbohydrate diet with low sugar uh, and high healthy fats, you know, the, the fats from, from nut consumption, olive oil consumption, 
uh, and, and this combined with a mostly plant-based diet, this seems to be uh, by far the most, uh, the, the ideal um, diet to uh, minimize cancer risk.